Hey everybody, welcome back to Cowboy Criminology. I'm your host, Derek Judd, the Cowboy Criminologist. Of course, we're, we're in part two of Gerard John Schaefer. Okay, so we covered a little bit of his background, uh, kind of from his early childhood, what that was like, and now we're talking about uh, his late high school to early college years. Okay. So Schaefer went on to to go to college at Florida Florida Atlantic University, and of course this is right during the height of the Vietnam War, and there were student groups that were going around to college campuses, and they were instructing potential draftees on ways that they could avoid the draft. So it's interesting to note here that Gerard John Schaefer Jr. actually told the draft board that he engaged in cross-dressing, which at the time was a very taboo perversion for a man to, uh, to not only engage in, but to admit to a draft board. And because that was deemed to be such a, such a detrimental perversion, uh, they disqualified him from military service. I always say that there are things that keep coming up that should have been red flags. Um, this is one of those things, okay? <clears throat> so this prevented him from, from being drafted. And in 1966, he's in his sophomore year of college. And he abducts and kills Nancy Elaine Leitner who's 21 years old, and Pamela Ann Nader, who's 20 years old. Now, it's, it, it should be interesting to note that a lot of serial killers will work up to abducting uh, multiple, vic or, yeah, multiple victims simultaneously. But this is really Gerard John Schaefer's first known criminal act. Now, I talked to you about uh, some of the some of the holdups in getting this video out to y'all last week. Well, one of them was, is when you watch or read about Gerard John Schaefer, a lot of the information that's out there is not chronological. And the, the order of the investigations kind of goes through uh, his first known kidnapping and his first known murders, and then everything else is kind of retroactive. And now, with uh, forensic genealogy, uh, we're starting to find that there have been more victims, and so it, it's 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 very difficult to put everything in its chronological place. So, so what I'm doing that's a little differently is I've eliminated. Uh, some of the victims that there's no real clear clear ties to. Like there's an eight and nine year old <clears throat> that he took credit for uh, abducting and cannibalizing, cannibalizing in Pomona, Be Pomo Pomona Beach, Pomona Beach. Anyway, uh, a beach in Florida, and he said he abducted and cannibalize those girls. Well, the girls' remains have never been found, unfortunately. But the description of the man that the girls were last seen with bears little to no uh, little little to no has little to nothing in common with the description of Gerard John Schaefer. Here's a caveat. Serial killers will simultaneously tell you they're innocent. They will also tell the same people they've told over and 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 over again that they're innocent about their crimes. And they will tell them in great details. Okay. Um, this is more, you'll find this a lot in sexual sadists. Richard Cottingham was infamous for this. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Oh, let me tell you how I did it. I, it's 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 very it's it's weird. They want people to believe in their innocence, but then they also want to instill, I guess, a sense of fear 
in people uh, anyway. So now the, his, his, the first two murders uh, occurred October 2nd, 1966 with uh, Wagner and Nader. And the original cause of death was believed that they had, they had gone hiking and then they ended up drowning while they were swimming. There really wasn't anything that led investigators to, to think foul play was involved. Um, and so it wasn't until, you know, 10 years later, or almost 10 years later, that evidence was found that Hey, this wasn't the this wasn't the case. 1968, Schaefer marries a woman named Martha Fogg. She's two years younger than Schaefer, but Schaefer seems to be on a fast track to, you know, pursuing a teaching career, which is, you know, a very noble career when it's done right. And Everything seems to be going really good. He's got he's got a, a, a new wife, and they're both young, and they're starting out, and things are going to are are looking up for both of them. Like they have the whole world ahead of them. So, if this sounds familiar, there's probably a good reason for it. But Martha starts to realize that there's something wrong with Gerard. There's something really weird about him. Uh, his requests for sex are not only becoming insatiable, but the things that he wants to do to her and the things he is trying to force her to do are becoming so deviant to the point where she's scared. So if you, if you remember... <clears throat> in the Richard Cottingham video, Richard Cottingham's wife divorced him for similar uh, for similar reasons. Uh, in fact, uh, her main, uh, Martha Fogg's main reason for wanting to divorce Schaefer was what she called extreme cruelty. So one could only imagine that spousal abuse, uh, abuse was involved. Um, and when you think spousal abuse, when you're dealing with a sexual sadist, especially a sexual sadist serial killer, this is usually a lack of compliance in the bedroom. And Martha was apparently not somebody who could be, whose personality could easily be reshaped. And she had, she had limits to what she would do. She had limits to what she wanted and she wasn't afraid to tell Schaefer that no you're we're we're not doing that you're not doing this to me i'm not going to allow it and a lot of times sexual sadists will pout and mope until they until they get their way and obviously because they were divorced married and divorced in right around the 2 year mark obviously that didn't that didn't play out but there's something important <clears throat> when you're doing an investigation involving a sexual sadist. The timeline of personal and professional relationships is crucial to nail down. You want to know what, that be what the behavior of this individual is like when everything is going their way. Everything is just coming up them. They don't have a care in the world. Everything is... All is right in their world. You will also notice when the stressors start to build up and you're going to start to see kind of where, kind of where things start to fall apart. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's a, so like in any, in any cycle of violence, you've got the honeymoon phase and then it, it cycles around to where there's an eruption of violence and then everything goes back to normal. Most sexual sadist serial killers are smart enough not to kill their wives and girlfriends. Most of the time, they're not willing to kill anybody that can be 
that people can trace back to them. Um, so when when the honeymoon moon phase ends and their demands, not requests, their demands for sex or certain sexual activities are not met, it's when the stressors start to build. And when that happens, it affects other other aspects of them. So so let's move on with that. So March of 1969, Schaefer is teaching high school. And the school starts getting a lot of complaints from parents, from students, from other faculty members about his behavior in the classroom. He's trying to impose his own moral code on the students. Uh, he's trying to indoctrinate them politically. Basically, he's trying to turn them into a bunch of Gerard John Schaefer clones. Now, if that sounds familiar to you at all, well, we'll move on. That's a different video. But when teachers are stepping outside of the subject matter and they're trying to get students to think a certain way or have a certain worldview that that should be a that should be a concern especially since he was a, a geography teacher now as a geography teacher i had uh, i had an excellent geography teacher mrs strasser and she would talk about when she was teaching geography we learned about a region of the world and she would talk about the religious ideologies political ideologies what the culture is like uh, different types of foods, uh, traditional clothing, th things like that. And to give you a sense of what it was like in that part of the world. A and that's where it stopped. So, um, but Schaefer, Schaefer push, pushed it. And because of his eccentric behavior in the classroom, Schaefer was fired from his job. Okay, so it's interesting. So from uh, so in, in March, he starts having all these problems and it doesn't take people long to realize, hey, we made a mistake hiring this guy. We're getting a lot of complaints. We need to move him along now. For a sexual sadist, it's not one thing doesn't just set them off. It has to be a complete loss of control in their life. It's called a stressor. If you've watched Criminal Minds or any police drama where um, the cops, the profilers, whoever it is, they're tracking down a type of offender, they're going to talk about stressors. We all have them. We have them in our daily life. And most of us have grown up with the coping skills to be able to recognize this is a sucky situation. But it is my situation and we need to move on. We can tell approximately where things started falling apart in Schaefer's life. So he gets fired from one job, picks up another job, and he's dealing with the exact same problems. His marriage is coming to an end. He knows it. And so there's a there's a there's a period where you know what the marriage is coming to an end. I don't even care anymore. I'm going to go and I'm going to do what I want. But unfortunately, it's that same attitude that gets him in trouble uh, where where he works. Now, in September of 1969, September 8th, he abducts a former neighbor, Nee Hanlon, and. She's 24. She had just gotten married. Uh, she said she was going to go to, uh, she said she was going to go out and I think go to, go to Miami or, or something and that, that she'd be back like the following day. A private investigator chases down Gerard John Schaefer as the last person to have contact with her. And Schaefer says, well, yeah, she contacted me for a ride to the airport. And then I never heard anything back from her. Highly, highly suspect. Okay. Now, November 1969 comes around. Oh, pause. So, 
Lee is the same Lee that we talked about, the one he he saw in dressing, the one he swore he was going to get. All right. So that's why that's why she's important to to this story. Um, Schaefer claimed he hadn't seen her, didn't know anything about her disappearance, tried getting in touch with her afterwards and to no avail. In 1978, her skeletal remains were found at a construction site with three bullet holes in her skull. It would later be found uh, a, a necklace that Lee was known to, known to wear that had a charm that it sp spelled out her name was found in Schaefer's possessions. <clears throat> so this is September. In November, he's fired from his teaching job. And in, uh, and in May of the next year, uh, and, and, shortly after, and shortly after that, he and his wife, uh, Martha, are divorced. So November, he loses his teaching job. So in December, uh, December 18th, 1969, he abducts Carmen Marie Halleck. So Ms. Halleck said that she was meeting with one of the teachers from the community college she was attending who was going to help her get a government job. Serial killers like to use ruses to entice people to meet with them. Um, pretending to be a, pl a police officer, pretending to have connections that can help people out. All under the guise of getting, of getting their victim alone, separate the victim from the herd. Um, so she goes to meet with Gerard John Schaefer, and she's wearing a black chiffon dress. Okay, I want you to keep that in, in your. I, I want you to keep that in in your mind because when we talk about the evidence that was found in Gerard John Schaefer's mother's home, uh, the black chiffon dress is going to be very important. All right. So, uh, so we, we, we fast forward 1970 Schaefer decides, okay, I'm going to work my way through the police Academy as a security officer. Uh, he was able to successfully get hired on with the Browder County Sheriff's or uh, police department. But he lied about his teaching career. So from the time he graduated to the time he applied, he said that he was a research student or a research associate for Florida, Florida, Florida Atlantic University. Back to back A's in a sentence. That's rough. And that he was actually in South America helping on a research project. They had no. They do a generic background check, check him out for any kind of criminal activity. Nothing shows up, and he's allowed into the police academy. In 1971, he ends up graduating, becomes a fully licensed peace officer. Now, here's where things start to get fun. Sexual sadists tend to learn from mistakes in their past. Martha Fogg was two years younger than her, and she was college educated, and she was her own person, and she wasn't going to be told what to do by somebody two years older than her. So he meets Teresa Dean. Now, Teresa Dean is six years younger than, uh, than Gerard John Schaefer. And she is more willing to please and more willing to indulge Schaefer in his proclivities, which he absolutely enjoys. Now, the, the reason I like talking about serial killers in a timeline kind of like this is you can, you can kind of see where the highs and lows are. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the new kind of wears off of the relationship, and in January of 1972, he abducts Belinda Hutchins. 
Melinda Hutchins is another individual that you you need to remember. Uh, if you remember about Carmen Halleck, you you need to remember the black chiffon dress. Uh, Belinda, she worked as a high end call girl. That's how she made her living. Um, around the time that Schaefer had applied to the uh, Wilton Gardens uh, or Wilton Manors Police Department. And she was last seen getting into a blue Datsun, which was the vehicle that Schaefer drove. Only it wasn't Gerard John Schaefer. It was a man named Jerry Shepard. Another common tactic, tactic for sexual sadists, whether they're uh, rapists or whether they're serial killers, is to have an alias. A name that, uh, a gnome de plume that they, they go by. Generally, they're not very creative. I mean, Jerry she Jerry Shepard, Gerard Schaefer. I mean, we're not. You know, you don't you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to crack the code on that one. Um, the reason they were able to tie Belinda's murder to Gerard John Schaefer is they found an appointment book of hers that said that she was meeting with Jerry Shepard. And we'll we'll get into more of that when we talk about the evidence that was collected against him. Uh, February 29th, 1972, Deborah Sulo is kidnapped on her way to her middle school. Uh, her school books were discovered, discarded in a trash can. The only thing really tying Gerard John Schaefer to... Uh, to Deborah's disappearance was the fact that um, she was an, he was an acquaintance of her father and that he'd been over to the house and um, like most sexual sadists, he probably made some kind of comment or maybe gave her special attention that kind of put people on edge and barring any other person they could think of, the police said uh, while they're investigating her disappearance said has you know tell tell me over the last 6 months 6 months who's been in your house repairman utility workers uh, friends family associates acquaintances and the father's like oh well there was uh, my buddy Gerard Schaefer who who is over here and maybe there was something there maybe maybe there wasn't um her body was never found, but what you have to understand is, especially in the areas where Gerard John, uh, Gerard John Schaefer liked to take his victims, you're talking about swampland, waterways. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of agricultural runoff. There's a you know a lot of creepy crawly creatures. Um, like I've like I've said in past videos. Water is the absolute enemy of forensics. And if you're trying to get rid of a body, water's not a bad place to, to do it. So um, it, it's never been conclusively proven, but there's a very high likelihood. Now, uh, the, the thing about Deborah Sulo that I want to talk about is if you notice the age range in, age ranges of Gerard John Schaefer's victims, they all tend to be in their late teens or early twenties. So this actually qualifies him as being an aphibophile. That's a type of paraphilia when an older adult. Uh, I'll read this verbatim because I don't want to get it wrong. I hate it when I give y'all bad information is an older adult that is sexually attracted to postpubescent teenagers or adolescents, usually those in age ranges 15 to 19. Adults with this attraction are called aphibophiles. Aphibophilia is not just a sexual attraction to teenage partners, but is when an adult pr prefers such, such, such sexual partners. I'm having a whole bunch of tongue twisters with the onomatopoeia today. So, now, Deborah Sulo 
seems to be on the on the early side of that. Now, um, girls do not develop into women at the exact same at, at the exact same time. Some develop earlier, some develop later, um, and with a with a, a sexual sadist, there could be confusion about her age. There could be uh, he thought that maybe she was more developed or looked more developed than she was. Uh, I th I think most likely when. An ephibophile like Gerard John Schaefer grabs a victim that's younger. It's usually because they're a victim of opportunity, and it's not necessarily a matter of fulfilling a sexual preference. Now, on the other side of that, 20, 21, 22, um, especially if the if the women looked younger than they were, that could totally trip the trigger for somebody like Gerard John Schaefer. So that's that's not really that's not really enough uh, in and of itself to say that you know that that takes away from him being an ephibophile. Okay, uh, March nineteenth, kidnaps Bonnie Taylor. Uh, this is this is interesting. So at this time. Uh, Schaefer's working with the Wilton Manor Police Department and Bonnie Taylor, who's 20 years old. The only connection that she had to Gerard John Schaefer was the fact that he had conducted a traffic stop on her. Now, interestingly enough, Gerard John Schaefer, who started off with a, a, a pretty good career, um, got a got an attaboy from the chief of police for his conduct on a on a warrant service that was that was done and a lot of times uh you see those for younger officers and it's just to kind of encourage them hey you know you're you're doing good you're on the right track uh we want to see we want to see more of this we want to see you progress and you know it's if you give a cop a cookie okay however gerard john schaefer would get into a lot of trouble because there would be complaints coming in about Schaefer for conducting traffic stops and then making contact with the individuals after the traffic stop occurred, which has always been, should always be a huge no-no. And if you have an officer in your department who's doing that, it, it should be a gigantic red flag. Um, I, I did, when I was working f as a police officer, I did background investigations for my agency. And Gerard John Schaefer was actually, along with personal experience from recognizing what officers you need to stay away from and officers you need to give a second chance to, um, there, were, there were a lot of things in Gerard John Schaefer's behavior as a police officer that I read about. Uh, in a in a book by Tom Barker, it's called Aggressors in Blue. It's a great book. A um, little disconcerting um, because it talks about his research of uncovering um, <laughs> of uncovering police criminal police misconduct and male female. I mean, he he goes through it all, and it's very eye opening. But some of the things that I read about would set off red flags in the background checks that I was doing. And Tom Barker specifically dedicates an entire chapter in Aggressors in Blue to Gerard John Schaefer. And he notes that there were three specific failures related to, excuse me, related to Gerard John Schaefer's background investigations. Okay. Um, the first is that not going back far enough and finding out that he was a teacher where he was dismissed because of ina inappropriate comments that he would make to female coworkers, female students. Uh, his failure to adapt to the educational environment, pushing his own beliefs 
on and one of the biggest 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 red flags in hiring a new officer is an officer who fails to take constructive criticism that is huge um one of the one of the most difficult things is hiring an officer with two or three years of experience under their belt who are bound and determined that they're going to change the agency to the way the new agency to the way they did it, their old agency. And it's like, you left that agency for a reason. You need, you need to learn how we do things. And that failure to adapt right there is a red flag. Um, I won't go into a personal tangent about that, but, uh, but the, the lack of that understanding is, is one of the things that made me decide to go to law school instead of pursuing my law enforcement career. So the second thing is that Schaefer was on the verge of being let go for his contacting uh, females that he had conducted traffic stops on. And the chief of police at Wilton Manors found out that Schaefer was interviewing for another position behind his back. Well, this infuriated the the chief of police because it's just common courtesy to say, "Hey, you know, I, I'm going to be inter- interviewing for a different uh, for a different department, you know, closer to home. We're moving. We want to move to this location. Whatever it is, most bosses will not take that as any kind of a threat or anything like that, and usually will be pretty supportive. But what cooked his goose? was that he had, the chief found out that he had forged a letter of recommendation. Now, there was some kind of snafu when Schaefer went to the Martin County Sheriff's Office. A a new sheriff had been put in charge to fulfill a term. Um, the department was woefully understaffed and trying trying to get people on and trying to do the administrative things and one thing or another. And unfortunately, the new sheriff did not conduct a thorough background investigation. Okay. And so all of these red flags in his past that would have been found by a thorough background investigation and I mean, with today's resources, this wouldn't even have to be a thorough background check. I mean, uh, I I probably would have ended this in about 15 minutes. Uh, As a background investigator, you kind of get to the point where you know there are two officers you're not going to hire right off the bat. The first one, and this sounds a little weird, is that officer that nobody has anything bad to say about. That's a huge red flag right there. When you have somebody that nobody has anything bad to say about, you know, this officer never loses their cool. This officer is loved by everybody. It's almost a canned response. Like they're trying to, they're either trying to get rid of this person or they have the, or this person has the entire department so snowed. Um, But usually the rank and file, will have that opinion about the officer. The administration won't tell you anything about this officer. And that's a huge red flag. So if I have somebody that nobody has anything bad to say about, no constructive criticism, one thing or another, pass. Uh, They're a headache you don't need. The other type of officer is, of course, somebody who has failure to adapt. They want to do it their way. Uh, Everything in their life is more important than doing their job. Uh, specifically officers who disappear for long periods at a time. Um, They hang out in what you might consider odd locations, like being around a high school if they're, well, for any officer, you know, unless they're there specifically to monitor for fights, traffic violations, things like that. All of these things could have been found. Well, Gerard Josh Schaefer ends up at the Martin County Sheriff's Office. All right. So we're going to go ahead and pause right there to go into part three. I'm Derek Judd, the Cowboy Criminologist. I really appreciate you watching my videos. Uh, Please like, subscribe, and share. And stay tuned because we got part three coming up. Take care.